The old and dead Egyptians left an enormous footprint behind, including huge edifices such as the Great Pyramids and Sphinxes. However, for a long time, so much about these old structures has been a mystery that researchers formed the wrong theories about them. But popular podcaster Joe Rogan has been talking to guests that have revealed hidden truths about these sphinxes. What is behind the big structures and how old exactly are they? In this video, we'll follow Joe Rogan as he uncovers the terrifying truths about the Egyptian sphinxes. Egypt is one country with a long history and its citizens cherish every bit of it, allowing them to identify with their long roots. Recently, the North African country reopened the 1.7-mile-long avenue of the Sphinxes in Luxor, which is flanked by over 1,000 Sphinx and Ram statues in a lavish ceremony hosted by Egypt's Ministry of Tourism and Antiquities. The path, which has been buried beneath layers of sand for centuries, connects the temples of Luxor and Karnak in Egypt's east. The extravagant march, which included pharaonic costumes, a symphony orchestra, and boats on the Nile, was attended by Egyptian President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi. The Avenue of the Sphinxes was discovered in 1949 during excavations in front of Luxor Temple by Zakaria Gonaim, and Mohammed Abdel Qadir, a leading Egyptian archaeologist, discovered the first section of the avenue near Luxor Temple between 1958 and 1960. However, there is another Sphinx that attracts far more attention in Egypt, and that's the Great Sphinx of Giza. If you know Joe Rogan very well, you will agree he doesn't shy away from hosting guests whose opinions are not mainstream. So when he brought on Professor Robert Schock to talk about the origin and age of the Sphinx of Giza, we expected sparks to fly. The expert Egyptologist brought evidence that the Sphinx of Giza is far older than conventional scientists give it credit for even though the whole scientific community does not agree. But what is the scientific consensus on this old structure in Giza? A sphinx is a creature with a lion's body and a human's head, with some variations. It is a well-known figure in Egyptian, Asian, and Greek mythology. The sphinx was a spiritual guardian in ancient Egypt and was most often depicted as a male with a pharaoh headdress, as is the great sphinx, and figures of the creatures were frequently included in tomb and temple complexes. Sphinx Alley, mentioned earlier in Upper Egypt, for example, is a two-mile avenue lined with Sphinx statues that connect the temples of Luxor and Karnak. There are also Sphinxes depicting the female pharaoh Hatshepsut, such as the granite Sphinx statue at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York and the large alabaster Sphinx at the Ramesseed Temple in Memphis, Egypt. Around the 15th to 16th centuries BC, the Sphinx was imported from Egypt to both Asia and Greece. In comparison to the Egyptian model, the Asian sphinx had eagle wings, was frequently female, and was often depicted sitting on its haunches with one paw raised. And the sphinx had wings and a serpent's tail in Greek legends, and it devoured all travelers who couldn't solve its riddle. Yikes! Interestingly, whatever Egyptians called the Great Sphinx during its heyday remains a mystery because the term sphinx comes from Greek mythology some 2,000 years after the statue was allegedly built. It is also unclear how Egyptians regarded the Great Sphinx during the Old Kingdom about 2613 to 2181 BC, as few texts discuss the statue. But whatever the case, by the end of the Old Kingdom, the statue had faded into the desert background and had gone unnoticed for centuries. Inscriptions between the Great Sphinx's paws on a pink granite slab tell the story of how the statue was saved from the sands of time. According to legend, Prince Tutmosa, son of Amenhotep II, fell asleep near the Sphinx. In Tutmosa's dream, the statue, calling itself Harmakhet, bemoaned its state of disarray and struck a deal with the young prince. If he cleared away the sand from the statue and restored it, it would help him become pharaoh. When the prince did become pharaoh Tutmosa IV, he fulfilled his side of the bargain by instituting a Sphinx-worshipping cult among his subjects. The figure was immortalized in statues, paintings, and reliefs across the country, and the Sphinx became a symbol of royalty and the power of the sun. Tamosa's effort, however, was not enough to save the Sphinx, as it was eventually forgotten again. Its body eroded and its face was harmed by the passage of time, it even lost its nose. 
Though some stories say Napoleon's troops shot off the statue's nose with a cannon when they arrived in Egypt in 1798, 18th century drawings indicate the nose vanished much earlier. More likely, a Sufi Muslim in the 15th century purposefully destroyed the nose to protest idolatry. The Sphinx was actually buried in sand up to its shoulders until the early 1800s when a Genoese adventurer named Captain Giovanni Battista Caviglia led a team of 160 men to try and ultimately fail to dig it out. However, French archaeologist Auguste Mariette was able to clear some of the sand from around the sculpture and in the 19th and 20th centuries, another French archaeologist, Emile Bareza, made another large excavation push. It wasn't until the late 1930s, however, that Egyptian archaeologist Selim Hassan was able to free the creature from its sandy tomb. Today, the Sphinx is unfortunately deteriorating due to wind, humidity, and pollution. Restoration efforts have been ongoing since the mid-1900s, with some of them failing and causing additional damage to the Sphinx. Now, there is no doubt that the Giza Sphinx is old. Even Shock agrees with this. What is up for debate is just how old the statue is. The most popular and widely accepted theory about the Great Sphinx is that it was built for Pharaoh Khafre in about 2603 to 2578 BC. Going by hieroglyphic texts, Khafre's father, Pharaoh Khufu, built the Great Pyramid, the oldest and largest of Giza's three pyramids. Khafre then decided to site his own pyramid next to his father's when he became Pharaoh. Khafre's pyramid is 10 feet shorter than the Great Pyramid but is surrounded by a more elaborate complex that includes the Great Sphinx and other statues. The presence of red pigment residues on the Sphinx's face suggests that the statue was painted. Given the organization of the pyramids and the Sphinx, some scholars believe the Great Sphinx and Temple Complex served a celestial purpose, namely to resurrect the soul of the pharaoh Khafre by channeling the power of the sun and other gods. But what evidence do supporters of this version of the Sphinx's history rely on? Well, for one thing, the Sphinx's head and face are strikingly similar to a life-size statue of Khafre discovered in the Valley Temple, that is, the ruins of a building adjacent to the Great Sphinx by Mariette in the mid-1800s. Mariette also discovered the remains of a causeway or processional road that connected the Valley Temple to a mortuary temple near Khafre's Pyramid. And in the early 1900s, Barres discovered another building, the Sphinx Temple, similar in design to the Valley Temple, directly in front of the Sphinx. In addition, in the 1980s, researchers claimed to have discovered evidence that the limestone blocks used in the walls of the Sphinx Temple came from the ditch surrounding the Great Statue, implying that quarry blocks for the Sphinx Temple were hauled away while the Great Sphinx was being built. Researchers estimate that carving the Great Sphinx out of a single mass of limestone would have taken 100 people three years. However, there is some evidence that these workers may have abruptly quit before the Sphinx and Temple complex were completed, such as partially quarried bedrock and remnants of a workman's lunch and toolkit. Many other theories for the Great Sphinx origins have been proposed over the years, most of which have been refuted by mainstream Egyptologists. According to some theories, the Sphinx's face resembles Khufu and thus the structure was built by Khufu. Another is that Pharaoh Jadefra, Khafre's older half-brother and Khufu's other son, built the Great Sphinx in honor of his father. And based on the style of the stripes on the Sphinx's headcloth, some believe the statue depicts Amenemhat II who lived from about 1929 to 1895 BC. However, Shock disagreed with all of that. He shocked the world in the early 90s when he recast the date of the Great Sphinx of Giza by several thousand years. Professor Robert Schock is a full-time faculty member at Boston University's College of General Studies. He was awarded his PhD in Geology and Geophysics from Yale University in 1983. Professor Schock was named Honorary Professor of the Nikola Vapt Sarov Naval Academy in Varna, Bulgaria in 2014 in recognition of his work on ancient civilizations. And in 2017, he was named director of Boston University's Institute for the Study of Civilization Origins by the College of General Studies, ISOC. Dr. Shock's more recent research has focused on the cataclysmic events that ended Earth's last ice age around 9700 BCE while also decimating the time's high civilizations. 
The overwhelming evidence gathered from various disciplines and presented in his book, Forgotten Civilization, New Discoveries on the Solar-Induced Dark Age 2021, points to massive solar outbursts as the cause. Shock first traveled to Egypt with John Anthony West in 1990 with the sole purpose of studying the Great Sphinx from a geological standpoint. He confessed he assumed the Egyptologists were correct in their dating, but soon discovered that the geological evidence contradicted what they were saying, and it didn't take him long to surmise that something was not right just by looking at the Sphinx. Bear in mind that Shock was determined to prove West's theory on the date of the Giza Sphinx wrong. When I went to Egypt for the first time was that some of the very old Egyptologists in the late 19th, early 20th century had actually suggested that just the way it looks, the feel of the Sphinx, not based on hard evidence really, that maybe it was older than the pyramids, that maybe it goes back earlier. So I felt that it wasn't all said and done and, you know, pat and sound that the Egyptologists necessarily knew what they were talking about in modern times because some of the earlier Egyptologists, who they held in very high respect supposedly, had said different things. The discovery was made half a century ago by a little-known French scholar named R. A. Schwaller de Lubitsch. Schwaller conducted a survey of the Egyptian Temple of Luxor between 1937 and 1952. His measurements of the floor plan and other detailed observations to the ruins revealed previously unknown geometrical relationships which were confirmed by French archaeologists. Schwaller discovered similar relationships at other locations. He reported his findings in 1949 and provided a more detailed account in 1957. A reviewer for the Journal of Near Eastern Studies urged his colleagues to take Schwaller's work seriously because it challenged the notion of Egypt's mathematical inferiority and suggested a new dimension to Egyptian religious belief. However, Schwaller sparked controversy by assigning speculative meanings to Egyptian architecture and inscriptions, and other scholars dismissed his findings. Schwaller discovered a strange physical anomaly in the Giza pyramid complex. He noticed that the erosion on the Sphinx was quite different from the erosion on other structures. Schwaller proposed that water rather than wind-borne sand was the cause of the erosion on the Sphinx. But nobody understood the implications of this observation at the time and it went largely unnoticed till the 1970s when independent Egyptologist John Anthony West raised the issue. West compared the erosion on the Sphinx, its temples, and the enclosure walls to the erosion on other Giza plateau structures. The rock on the Sphinx and its surrounding walls was badly worn, giving it a sagging appearance. The edges were rounded and deep fissures were visible. Surfaces on other structures on the plateau showed only the sharper abrasion of wind and sand. Now, Egypt experienced millennia of heavy rainfall, which marked the post-glacial northward shift to the temperate zone. This period lasted roughly 10,000 to 5,000 BCE, and by the end of it, the Sahara had changed from green savanna to desert. Then, from around 4,000 to 3,000 BCE, there was a shorter but more intense period of rainfall, which tapered off by the middle of the third millennium. West hypothesized that the distinctive weathering on the Sphinx complex was caused by flooding from the post-glacial transition, implying that the Sphinx was carved during or before the transition. Orthodox archaeologists flatly refused to consider West's theory. However, West was able to persuade Shock to investigate the question in 1990, and the two ended up in Giza in June of that year. Shock discovered heavy erosional features on the body of the Sphinx and the walls of the Sphinx enclosure, the pit or hollow left after the Sphinx's body was carved from the bedrock. This made him conclude it could have only been caused by rainfall and water runoff. Shock noted that the Sphinx is located on the outskirts of the Sahara Desert and the region has been quite arid for the last 5,000 years. Furthermore, several structures securely dated to the Old Kingdom show only wind and sand erosion, a completely different matter from the erosion by water. Shock concluded that the oldest portions of the Great Sphinx, known as the Core Body, must date back to an earlier period, at least 5,000 BCE but also potentially to the end of the last ice age around 10,000 BCE when the climate was very different and included more rain. 
people get confused. They say, couldn't it be rising Nile floods? No. Geologically, that would give a very different signature on the rock. It's not floods coming up from the bottom. It's actually precipitation and rainfall runoff coming from above. Many people objected to the Great Sphinx being that old, owing to the fact that the head is clearly a dynastic Egyptian head, and the dynastic period did not begin until around 3000 BCE. But if you examine the current Great Sphinx, you may notice that the head is too small for the body. Schock claims it is obvious that the current head is not the original head. The original head would have deteriorated due to weathering and erosion. It was later recarved during dynastic times, and the recarving naturally reduced its size. As a result, the Great Sphinx's head is not the original head. In fact, the Sphinx might not have been a Sphinx at all. It's possible it was a lion, but the most recent evidence suggests it was a lioness. To further test the theory of an older sphinx, Schock conducted seismic studies around the base of the statue to measure the depth of subsurface weathering. His team essentially used a sledgehammer on a steel plate to create sound waves that penetrated the rock, reflected, and returned to the surface. This provided them with information about the subsurface characteristics of the limestone bedrock. Upon analyzing the data, Shock discovered that the extraordinary depth of the subsurface weathering supported his conclusion that the Sphinx's core body must have been built around 5000 BCE or earlier. And the team discovered something else during the seismic studies. They uncovered evidence of a cavity or chamber beneath the Sphinx's left paw. Some have suggested that this could be a hall of records. They also discovered some minor cavities beneath and around the Sphinx, and the data suggests that there may be a tunnel-like feature running the length of the body. When he first proposed that the Great Sphinx was much older than previously thought, Egyptologists challenged Shock by asking for evidence of the earlier civilization that could have built the Sphinx. They were certain that sophisticated culture or civilizations did not exist prior to 3000 or 4000 BCE. However, there is now evidence of high culture dating back approximately 12,000 years at Gebekli Tepe in Turkey. But why these early glimmers of civilization and high culture vanished only to reappear thousands of years later has remained a major mystery, though. Some scientists have tried to explain away the unique weathering of the Sphinx using a number of theories. One such researcher is Robert Temple, who believes a moat is responsible for the water weathering of the statue. However, Shock identifies six pieces of evidence. The first is that the core blocks of the Sphinx Temple, built from blocks removed from the Sphinx enclosure when the Sphinx body was first carved, and the Valley Temple to the south, have heavy precipitation-induced weathering. During the Old Kingdom, these limestone temples were refurbished with the Aswan granite facings. The nature of the very ancient weathering seen on the temple blocks beneath the Old Kingdom granite veneer cannot be explained by the moat theory. Second, surface erosion is much more severe on the western end of the Sphinx enclosure, tapering off dramatically toward the eastern end. This is due to ancient rains and the area's paleohydrology. This erosion is incompatible with the enclosure's pooled water. Third, rain has eroded the highest levels of the middle member strata, as seen in the Sphinx enclosure on the western end. If the moat theory were correct, the lower strata on the eastern end of the Sphinx enclosure would have been most heavily eroded due to water brought in via canals from the Nile, but this is not the case. Fourth, based on his analyses, seismic data demonstrating the depth of weathering beneath the floor of the Sphinx enclosure indicates a minimum age of at least 7,000 years ago for the core body of the Sphinx, and more realistically on the order of 12,000 years ago. Standing water in the Sphinx enclosure would not hasten the depth of weathering beneath the enclosure's floor. Five, the vertical fissures observed in the walls of the Sphinx enclosure are indicative of precipitation and water runoff. They exhibit no characteristics that are diagnostic or even suggestive of being formed by artificial dredging of the Sphinx enclosure, as suggested by Robert Temple. And six, assuming the Sphinx was in a pool, either the water level around the Sphinx was the same as the surrounding water table, or the pool's walls and floor were sealed and watertight, and any artificial walls, such as on the eastern end, were strong enough to withstand the water pressure. Notably, the current western end of the Sphinx enclosure is at a much higher elevation than the eastern end. 
but water erosion is visible at the higher elevations at the western end. Because water seeks its own level, if the water in a supposed moat reached the height of the Sphinx enclosure's western end, then the eastern end, as well as the walls along the northern and southern sides, must have been built up to a comparable height. This is regardless of whether the eastern wall of the enclosure, which forms the western wall of the Sphinx Temple, has a natural bedrock foundation or is entirely made of cut and placed stone. The ancient water table was much lower than the level of the Sphinx enclosure's floor, or else the Sphinx Temple would have been flooded. The Sphinx enclosure could not have held a deep pool of standing water if it was simply carved from the bedrock, as all evidence suggests. The bedrock in the enclosure has a cast morphology and would leak like a sieve. The enclosure would need to be completely sealed, perhaps with mortar or cement, but there is no evidence of such sealing. If the enclosure had been sealed in this manner, it would be incompatible with the temple's dredging theory for the vertical fissures. Furthermore, if the Sphinx had been sitting in a pool of water, chambers and tunnels beneath it would have been flooded from above unless the Sphinx enclosure had been watertight. West and Shock presented their evidence to a Geological Society of America meeting in San Diego in October 1991. Rather than pointing out some obvious flaw in their findings, a number of geologists offered their support. Other geologists, however, raised two concerns in newspaper interviews and private correspondence. One person wondered if the seismic refraction data matched a natural fluctuation in the rock layer itself. The seismic profile, in fact, did not follow the natural dip of the rock. And another geologist proposed that the Sphinx as a whole, rather than just the head, was a natural outcrop of rock. A yardang, as such an outcrop is known in geology, could have eroded for millennia before being carved. One of the criticisms of Shock's theory is that one need not go back to the last ice age to account for water damage at Giza. Several instances of violent rains and severe flooding have been documented in the Nile region throughout history. W.F. Hume, then director of the Geological Survey of Egypt, described the damage and erosion caused by these storms in his 1925 book Geology of Egypt. He wrote, it must not be forgotten that desert rains produce sheep floods. The vast amount of water falling cannot be dealt with in many cases by the channels already existing, and as a result it makes new passages for itself along lines of least resistance. The deep grooves are cut through the more friable strata. Furthermore, Zahi Hawass, the director of antiquities at Giza, observes that the same erosion patterns cited by shock persist on a daily basis. Large flakes are constantly shed on some parts of the Sphinx's surface, much to the chagrin of archaeologists and conservators who have yet to agree on the cause or cure. However, they do agree on one point. The erosion is clearly not caused by rain caused by the melting of Ice Age glaciers, as claimed by shock. Wind, weathering by water-saturated sand, and crystallization of salts naturally present in the limestone after they are dissolved by morning dew are all possible mechanisms. There are, however, researchers that back Shock's theory. In fact, one of them, Graham Hancock, would like to push the date back further. He claims that the Sphinx is a Leo symbol and that it was designed to face the rising sun when it was in the constellation of Leo at the vernal equinox because it's facing precisely due east. Hancock says that the sun rose in Leo between 10,970 and 8,830 BCE at the vernal equinox. Hancock also believes that the three main pyramids of Giza were constructed to represent the stars of Orion's belt. During this time, the belt of Orion also reached its lowest point in the sky. He dates the layout of the entire complex to around 10,450 BCE by combining these two pieces of astronomical data. This is more than 8,000 years older than conventional dating. Hancock also argues with the Valley Temple, which is located immediately south of the Sphinx. He suggests the temple with its square section columns, lack of inscriptions or reliefs, and the construction techniques cannot be contemporary with the 4th dynasty Mastaba tombs scattered across the plateau. These tombs had more architectural detail and were lavishly decorated. The Valley Temple as such must be immeasurably older and thus contemporary with his redated Sphinx. Hancock also compares a structure to the rear of the New Kingdom Temple at Abydos to Khafre's Valley Temple at Giza due to architectural similarities. The Osiron Shrine of Osiris, like the Valley Temple, has square section pillars devoid of reliefs and hieroglyphic inscriptions. 
but it does have inscriptions on walls and lintels that name it Seti the First, pharaoh around 1290 to 1279 BCE, who is known to have been the founder of the main temple at Abydos. Hancock, however, considers these inscriptions to be later additions. Let's hear how old you think the Sphinx in Giza is in the comments section below.